Did Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, write a letter to Emperor Tiberius about Jesus? This letter supposedly covers Jesus' miracles, trial, crucifixion, and even resurrection. Could there be amazing details in this report not even found in the Gospels? And what about the Pilate Stone discovered in Caesarea Maritima in 1961 AD? How does it shed light on Jesus' crucifixion? Today, we're delving into this intriguing video to uncover the mysteries and explore whether Pilate penned an extremely alarming letter about Jesus' crucifixion. There exists a document known as the Acts of Pilate. It was originally part of an apocryphal book called the Acts of Peter and Paul, believed to have been written in the first century. This document was later included intact in another apocryphal book from the fourth century, the Gospel of Nicodemus. But the question arises, is it a factual account, slightly embellished, or entirely fabricated? Scholars are divided on the authenticity of the Acts of Pilate. Some ancient writers believe that Pilate indeed sent such a report. It's reasoned that Pilate may have wanted to defend himself before Emperor Tiberius, especially if Herod Antipas was speaking ill of him to Caesar. This motive seems logical, raising questions about the document's credibility. The Acts of Pilate contain details about Jesus' miracles, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. However, there's uncertainty regarding the accuracy of these events. Could it be a genuine historical account or a narrative crafted by Christians to add credibility to their beliefs? With this ambiguity, it's challenging to ascertain the document's reliability. Historical Importance of Pilate's Report Pontius Pilate's report to Emperor Tiberius holds significant historical value, shedding light on the events surrounding Jesus Christ's crucifixion. This document, known as the Acts of Pilate, was referenced by early church father Justin Martyr in A.D. 138, suggesting its widespread recognition and preservation. Justin Martyr's letter to Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius mentioned Pilate's report, indicating its prominence among early Christians. The report's contents, including details about Jesus' crucifixion and the division of his garments, were well known and respected within Christian circles. The Acts of Pilate also gained recognition beyond the Christian community. Another church father, Tertullian, relayed an account suggesting that Emperor Tiberius attempted to deify Jesus based on Pilate's report. While this claim lacks historical verification, it highlights the report's influence even among non-Christian factions. Despite the absence of concrete evidence in Roman archives regarding Tiberius's actions, the Acts of Pilate remains a crucial historical artifact. Its existence underscores the significance of Pilate's role in Jesus' crucifixion and the enduring impact of these events on both Christian and non-Christian communities. The Acts of Pilate hold immense significance, demonstrated by Emperor Maximian's attempt to create a counterfeit version in A.D. 311. This deceitful maneuver aimed to weaken the influence of Christianity, highlighting the profound impact of the original document within the Roman Empire. Commencement with Pilate's Letter We begin with the opening lines of Pilate's letter to Emperor Tiberius. The letter begins with a greeting where Pilate addresses recent events in his province. He expresses his intention to provide a detailed account of these events, acknowledging their potential to impact the destiny of their nation in the course of time. The letter says, Dear Mark, greetings. As our gladiators say, he who is about to die salutes you. Yes, I'm facing the end. Rome and fate have decided, and I'm ready to go with a wry smile. But before I depart on this journey from which few return, I need to share something important. This isn't a list of my sins. They're no different from others of my rank, just trying to escape the monotony of life. I'm ready to leave, especially since the emperor hinted it was time to go. I won't fall on my sword. I've always hated bloodshed, especially my own. Instead, I'll find another way. The door to death is always open, as your master said. Speaking of which, his words now hold special meaning for me. This letter will remain unread. I've sworn to keep certain things secret. Maybe in death I'll have time to share with fellow departed souls, even you. But what if you can't join me? It would be a disappointment. I regret not sharing certain truths while I was alive, but I couldn't, 
bound by oath and admiration for your master. Septimus, my dear friend, will bury this letter on his estate. It's a quiet, peaceful spot overlooking vineyards. Maybe one day someone will find it and discover the truth. I miss our conversations, even if we seldom agreed. Your presence would be a comfort today. Let me tell you what happened when I took your master aside. Despite the uproar outside, I couldn't condemn him. He was innocent, yes, but more than that, he was lovable. I couldn't order his death any more than I could harm my own son. I told him the charges were absurd, but he seemed unfazed. He claimed my decision to crucify him was a favor, and changing it would be a disservice. I made my interpreter repeat his words, threatening torture if he mistranslated. I offered him a noble death by suicide, even my own sword, but he insisted on crucifixion, saying it was necessary for his mission. I was bewildered but felt a strange lethargy overcome me, until he explained further. He spoke of those who feel unworthy of salvation, needing proof of God's love. Only by his death as the Son of God could they find faith and love for themselves. He asked me to keep his request a secret. I swore by the gods, moved by his plea. He left with gratitude, and I wept, realizing the weight of my decision. After a confrontation with Emperor Caligula, I was summoned back to Rome. Fearing for my life, I left for Gaul, knowing the emperor wanted my blood. I faced the reality of my imminent death. I write to you, Mark, to reveal the truth about Jesus' death and resurrection. I was partly responsible, but I hope you'll understand my reasons. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. My wife questioned my decision, unaware of Jesus' wishes. Her persistence was a torment, but I couldn't reveal the truth. I retreated to solitude, grappling with my actions. I dreamt of standing before a tomb at dawn, feeling serene despite its ominous presence. A guard told me they had resurrected him. I woke with a newfound clarity and determination. I pondered the nature of truth and realized it's subjective. What people believe becomes their truth. I concluded that my deceitful actions were justified by the truth as perceived by others. Jesus believed in his resurrection, but I, a cynical Roman, knew better. He trusted his God, but gods can be capricious. While Hebrews may believe such miracles, Romans rely on reason. You once argued about Heracles' ascension to Olympus, but I clarified that only his spirit ascended, not his body. Similarly, Jesus' disappearance from the tomb didn't prove resurrection. You questioned how the disciples could move the heavy stone guarding the tomb, but I had sealed it myself, and the disciples were too despondent to attempt anything. In the grand theater of life, I, a humble Roman prefect, played a pivotal role in the unfolding drama surrounding your revered master, Jesus of Nazareth. Allow me to unveil the intricate details of my stratagem, crafted not only to assert my agency, but also out of a deep, albeit unconventional, affection for the man himself. As dawn broke and my wife departed, leaving me to my musings, a surge of determination coursed through my veins. It was time to take decisive action, to prove to myself and others that I was not merely a passive observer, but a shaper of destinies. With a resolute spirit, I commanded my most loyal soldiers to stand guard at the tomb, a scene you are already familiar with but the full extent of my plan remained veiled, known only to me and the trusted few who would execute it. Under the cloak of darkness, when the night sky enveloped the land like a shroud, my soldiers executed their clandestine mission. With precision and stealth, they rolled aside the stone sealing the tomb and retrieved the body of the crucified prophet. This was not an act of disbelief, but a calculated maneuver orchestrated to ensure the safety of Jesus' remains and prevent any desecration by his enemies. The body was then entrusted to individuals indebted to me, individuals bound by loyalty and obligation. They whisked away into the night, bearing their solemn burden to a hidden cave near the Dead Sea, a sanctuary shrouded in secrecy. Even I dared not venture there, fearing that my resolve might falter and undo the deed I had undertaken. 
Some may question the necessity of such elaborate subterfuge, arguing that Jesus would have risen from the dead regardless. Yet, in my eyes, it was a gesture of profound respect and love for the man who had captivated my soul with his words and deeds. My actions were not a repudiation of his teachings, but a testament to my unwavering commitment to safeguarding his legacy. And now, as I bid you farewell, dear Mark, I do so with a sense of fulfillment and peace. In recounting the truth of my involvement, I hope to garner not judgment, but understanding. For in the enigmatic tapestry of life, motives may appear convoluted, yet love remains a guiding light in its purest form. As I embark on my final journey, guided by the river's gentle current, I hope that my deeds will be recognized for what they truly were, a testament to the enduring power of love and the indomitable spirit of humanity. Ave atque vale. What the letter says? Pontius Pilate expressed deep concerns and reflections in his communication to Caesar, highlighting the challenges he faced governing Judea. He lamented the difficulty of controlling Jerusalem, considering it the most troublesome among conquered cities. Pilate feared insurrection due to the city's turbulent populace and had limited military resources at his disposal, with only a single centurion and a small contingent of soldiers. In his letter, Pilate revealed his request for reinforcement from the prefect of Syria, who in turn lacked adequate troops to defend his own province. This exchange underscores the precarious situation faced by Roman authorities in maintaining control over their territories. Pilate's words prompt us to pause and reflect on their significance. They reveal the vulnerability of Jerusalem's defense, which relied on a lone centurion and a small number of soldiers within his cohort. This revelation sheds light on the challenges faced by Roman authorities in maintaining order and stability in the region, amidst the expanding ambitions of the empire. Valerius Gratus, Pontius Pilate's predecessor, faced frustrations in governing Judea, particularly Jerusalem, which he deemed exceptionally difficult due to its turbulent populace. This frustration laid the groundwork for Pilate's subsequent struggles. Pilate's account reveals the inadequacy of his military resources to maintain order in Jerusalem. Despite the city's potential for unrest, Pilate had only a single centurion and a small contingent of soldiers. This scarcity of troops highlighted the challenges of Roman control and the difficulty of suppressing potential uprisings. He even expressed concerns about the broader context of imperial overextension. He feared that the empire's ambitious expansion beyond its capacity to defend its territories would ultimately lead to its downfall. Also, the Roman governor worried about the Roman Empire's resources. He felt there might be too much strain on them, which could lead to problems for the empire's stability. This concern of his becomes clear as we go through the story. The document contains hints that Pilate was worried about what might happen if the Roman Empire stretched its resources too thin. He was concerned about how this might affect the empire's stability in the long run. These worries are important because they influence Pilate's decisions, especially during Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Before the events of Jesus' trial and crucifixion, Pilate had concerns about the consequences of overextension and the lack of enough military resources. These worries of his are like clues hinting at what's to come later in the story. They suggest that Pilate's decisions were influenced by his fears about the empire's stability and the strain on its resources. Pilate's concerns about future events can be seen in his words, Among the various rumors that came to my ears, there was one that attracted my attention. This shows that he was already thinking about the consequences of certain actions. As we delve deeper into the document, we see how Pilate's worries about the shortage of troops played a big part in his decision to order the crucifixion of Jesus. These concerns influenced his thinking and actions throughout the trial and crucifixion process. It becomes clear that Pilate's decisions were shaped by his concerns about the empire's stability and the strain on its resources. The Arrival of Jesus in Galilee In particular, a young man emerged in Galilee, preaching with remarkable conviction about a new way of life. Some were concerned that he aimed to incite rebellion against the Romans, but those fears soon dissipated. 
Jesus of Nazareth spoke not as an enemy of the Romans, but as a friend, remarked one observer. On one occasion, amidst a large gathering at the place of Silo, a serene young man was seen addressing the crowd. This young man was none other than Jesus. His calm demeanor and captivating speech set him apart from the rest. His golden-colored hair and beard gave him a celestial aura, noted the witness. Jesus seemed to radiate peace, and his appearance suggested he was around 30 years old. The observer was deeply struck by Jesus' presence, finding it unparalleled. Never have I seen a sweeter or more serene countenance, they reflected. Jesus' gentle demeanor and wise words left a lasting impression on all who encountered him, sparking curiosity and admiration among the crowds. The description of Jesus as having blonde hair and a beard, in contrast to his hearers with their black beards and tanned complexions, is indeed intriguing. It's noteworthy because it's one of the few recorded explanations of Jesus' appearance in historical documents. However, this detail raises questions about its authenticity. Was it added later by scribes copying the document, or did Jesus truly have lighter-colored hair and beard compared to those around him? While it's difficult to ascertain, the inclusion of this detail adds depth to the historical narrative. Returning to the narrative, Pontius Pilate, unwilling to interrupt Jesus, continued his walk but instructed his secretary, Manilus, to join the group and listen. Manilus, a Judean native and proficient in Hebrew, was the grandson of a chief conspirator from the region of Atia. His presence in the crowd signaled Pilate's interest in Jesus' teachings and the unfolding events. Manilus, devoted and trustworthy, recounted to Pilate the words spoken by Jesus at Silo. Pilate was deeply impressed, noting that Jesus' teachings surpassed anything he had heard from scholars or philosophers. Jesus' response to a question about paying tribute to Caesar particularly struck Pilate. Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. Pilate recognized the wisdom in Jesus' words and granted him considerable freedom despite the potential backlash from Roman authorities. Pilate acknowledged that Jesus posed no threat to Roman rule. He could have arrested and exiled Jesus, but such an action would have contradicted Roman principles of justice. Pilate believed that Jesus was neither seditious nor rebellious, so he extended his protection to him. This allowed Jesus the freedom to continue his teachings, assemble followers, and address the people without interference from Roman authorities. Pilate's decision reflected his respect for Jesus' integrity and the principles of justice upheld by the Romans. The freedom granted to Jesus by Pilate angered not only the poor, but also the wealthy and influential members of society. In Pilate's view, Jesus was outspoken against the rich and powerful, which was a political move. Despite this, Pilate chose not to restrict Jesus' liberty, even though complaints against Jesus' behavior were frequent at the praetorium. Jesus' criticisms of the scribes and Pharisees, whom he called a race of vipers, and his disdain for the ostentatious displays of wealth by the rich caused resentment among the influential classes. Pilate received numerous complaints about Jesus' behavior, with some even suggesting that misfortune might befall him. There were warnings that an appeal to Caesar would be made if the praetorium failed to take action. Despite the pressure from influential quarters, Pilate remained hesitant to take drastic action against Jesus. He recognized the potential political ramifications of such a decision and was cautious about escalating the situation further. Pilate's Dilemma Pilate, the Roman governor, faced a tough decision regarding Jesus. Although he was urged to crucify Jesus to maintain peace, he believed Jesus wasn't deserving of death. Instead, he handed Jesus over to prevent a revolt, as he was promised reinforcements after the Parthian War. This hesitation shows Pilate's struggle to balance maintaining order without compromising his authority. One significant artifact related to Pilate is the Pilate Stone, also known as the Pilate Inscription. Discovered in 1961 near Caesarea Maritima in Israel, this ancient stone offers insights into Jesus' time. It doesn't directly mention Jesus' crucifixion, but provides historical context, 
reinforcing the existence of Pontius Pilate and his role as governor during Jesus' time. While the Pilate stone doesn't detail Jesus' crucifixion, it corroborates historical accounts of Pilate's governorship. This artifact confirms Pilate's presence in Judea during Jesus' lifetime and underscores his authority in the region. Although it doesn't offer direct evidence of Jesus' trial or crucifixion, it contributes to our understanding of the political and religious landscape of the time. The Pilate Stone is a special find in archaeology. It's a dedication carved on a limestone block that holds great significance. It's solid evidence that Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, actually existed. This matches up with the stories we read in the New Testament about Jesus' trial and crucifixion. The inscription on the Pilate Stone. The inscription on the Pilate Stone reads, To the divine Augusti, this Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. It was found in Caesarea Maritima, a coastal city in Israel that was very important during Roman times. Archaeologists stumbled upon it when they found it being used on the stairs leading to a theater at the site. They recognized its importance because of the Latin writing on the limestone block, Caesarea Maritima was a major city and administrative hub in Roman times, so finding such a significant artifact there adds to its importance. The discovery of the Pilate Stone provides concrete evidence of Pontius Pilate's existence and role as governor. It's a crucial piece of history that helps us better understand the context of Jesus' time. So what do you think of the alarming letter by Pilate append on Jesus' crucifixion? Comment below and subscribe for more.